Okay. Welcome as everybody trickles in, we'll just give a, a couple seconds, minute here or so to let everybody enter. Okay. Great, right. as everybody's kind of trickling in, welcome to our fifth annual lecture on diversity, inclusion, and equity. We'll give it a little bit longer to see if any more join us, but we'll get started shortly. Okay, great. Excellent. Okay. So um, welcome to, to everyone, to our immediate Hopkins family and our extended Hopkins family um, for a really special event that I think many of us really look forward to kind of every, every year. Um, so my name is Carrie Neiman. I'm one of the otologists at Johns Hopkins um, and also head up the department's diversity and inclusion efforts. Um, there's a, a few logistics just want to kind of keep in mind uh, for today's webinar as we get started. Um, we will be kind of recording everything um, just so that we can share it with those who can't join us today. Um, and we will also uh, ask that if you've got questions for the panelists, we do have a, some time carved out towards the end of the session uh, for questions. So please feel free uh, to, to use the, the chat. That'll be the primary way um, in your Questions may not be seen by everybody, but will be seen by panelists and we'll go through those. Um, and we do ask people to, to stay on mute as, as we're engaging. Um, and, <coughs> and towards the end, if there's some time for questions, can unmute yourself and ask questions by raising your hand in addition to the chat feature. Um, so with that, I will start just by a little bit saying today, we are celebrating a, a number of things. Um, we're really excited that we're hosting, you know, the fifth annual, um, diversity, inclusion, and equity lecture um, for the department. And then we're, we're also celebrating the endowment of the lecture in honor of Dr. Sandra Lin, which is something I, I can't emphasize enough how I think how important this is in terms of just how foundational Dr. Lin's work was really within our department. And I think really setting what, you know, setting the bar high for what we do um, in otolaryngology, you know, over 10 years ago, Dr. Lin um, started much of this work, um, whether it was thinking about equity around, you know, salary by gender, by race, ethnicity, among faculty members, creating pipeline programs for students who identify as underrepresented minorities in in medicine, um, this lectureship, and, and many other things. Um, so before we get too far, um, I would like to turn it over to our director, uh, Dr. Isley. Thank you, Carrie, and uh, congratulations uh, to you for your efforts uh, putting this together. You've been a great uh, shepherd of this uh, very important uh, lecture. I'd like to first welcome our guests, Dr. Jones, Dr. Francis, and Dr. Taylor, will be formally introduced by Dr. Neiman in a little while. But we appreciate you being here with us and sharing with us your thoughts in this important lecture. Uh, I want to say congratulations to Dr. Lin. Um, the department named this lecture uh, in honor of Dr. Lin because of her efforts, as Carrie mentioned, uh, in diversity, inclusion, and equity. And uh, she has been a, a leader in the institution as one award for her leadership in this area. And so it's very befitting uh, that this lecture carry her name uh, in an endowed lecture, meaning in perpetuity, uh, we will have this lecture and, uh, and uh, I wanna congratulate you, Sandra. And thank you for all you've done in this area. Thanks Dave for your kind words and Carrie too. I just wanna take um, a minute to say thank you for the naming this lecture. It's a great honor. Um, but more than you know, an honor for myself, I hope it's a time once a year we can come and really celebrate all the efforts of our department because really it's our department embracing this important mission, all the colleagues who have served as mentors. Um, and so it's really time for us to celebrate together. I mean, we, I think we've, what we've done together has been a 
a model for other departments who want to really support diversity, inclusion, and equity. So um, I would like to thank Dave Isley and Lloyd Miner who gave me the opportunity and always had their support as we did these um, efforts. Um, and um, I wanna thank the donors who endowed um, this lecture, Donna and Bell in our development office. I wanna say um, thank you to our past speakers because I think I see Dave Brown as one of the attendees. So thank you, and I, if, I, if there's any other of the past um, uh, you know, um, speakers and um, a special thanks to Dr. Carrie Neiman, who you know, we kind of did part one, I think, of addressing some things in our department, but now even looking beyond our department at um, di di health disparities, social justice, these really important um, things um, that we, many of us face every day and our patients as well. And um, the issues of diversity, inclusion, and equity have always been important to our family, particularly to my late father, who actually um, tackled these issues at his own workplace. So I see my, I think my sister's on and my son here. To, um, so I'd like to say thanks for joining. And I'm really looking very much forward to Dr. Francis Jones and Taylor's panel. So thank you um, for um, joining us today. and. I'm really honored that you guys would um, do this first name lectureship for me. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dr. Lynn. Um, and thank you, Dr. Isley. Um, if, if, you, if you guys want to go ahead and turn off your video, that's A-OK. -okay. Um, at this point, thank you guys both for, for joining us. Um, Excellent. So with that, um, we'll go ahead and, and get started with, with our panel. I'll give everybody just a heads up generally kind of how this webinar is, is structured. So we'll, I'll give some introductions. Each panelist is going to share some personal reflections um, just broadly around the topic of diversity, inclusion, and equity. And then we're going to engage in, in some discussion um, with some focused questions. And then depending on where we're at with time, open up then um, to the discussion you know more broadly um, with any questions from the audience um, so that's that's the, the overall structure um, so um, with that I will just provide a, a brief introduction for, for each of our panelists we're really excited we usually just have one speaker um, but I feel like this year really more than ever um, really wanted to invite some conversation um, really to to make sure that kind of check in where we're at right now and and really thinking about how can we keep moving towards the future. Um, so, so with that, um, we have Dr. Carrie Francis, who graduated from St. Louis University School of Medicine with honors. She completed her residency training in otolaryngology, head and neck surgery at the University of Arkansas. She then went on to her fellowship in pediatric otolaryngology at Reddy Hospital, Children's Hospital in San Diego. She is currently an associate professor in pediatric otolaryngology at Kansas University Medical Center, um, where she is a busy surgeon there, but in addition to that, also serves a number of roles um, within the academic institution. Uh, she has a passion for the development of physicians and learners to inspire, empower, authenticity, and community building, to create an agency needed to thrive, and lead really from within. And in part of that, uh, she serves as Associate Dean of Workforce Innovation and Empowerment for the Kansas University Medical Center community. She is an active member in a number of professional organizations you know, nationally, um, including currently the Vice Chair of the Otolaryngology Section of the National Medical Association. So thank you very much, Dr. Francis, for joining us. Next, um, we'll move on to Dr. Lamont Jones, who completed his medical school and his residency in otolaryngology head and neck surgery at the University of Michigan. He then went on to um, complete his fellowship at SUNY Upstate Medical University um, in facial plastics and craniofacial reconstructive surgery. He completed his MBA at Michigan State University. He currently serves as the vice chair of the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery at Henry Ford. He's an expert on the 
treatment and pathogenesis of keloids. He currently has a five-year $900,000 grant from the National Institutes of Health uh, to study exome singling and the keloid microenvironment. Uh, he is an active student um, mentor and volunteer at many local and international charities, including medical mission work in Kenya, as well as other professional organizations nationally in terms of his leadership. So thank you very much, Dr. Jones, for, for joining us. And last but not least, we have Dr. Rodney Taylor, who is a professor of otorhinolaryngology, head and neck surgery, and chair at the, the Department of Otorhinolaryngology, head and neck surgery at the University of Maryland. Um, he has been a, an active surgeon scientist as well, and has a practice that's dedicated to comprehensive care of head and neck cancer patients. Um, he started out his career at, at Harvard um, and then went on to Harvard Medical School. He did his residency at the Univers University of Michigan. He also completed his Master of Public Health while at the University of Michigan um, and has now really taken on a number of leadership positions within his university um, around these issues of diversity, inclusion, and equity. So thank you very much and welcome, Dr. Taylor. Great, so that's our, our wonderful esteemed panel. Um, I will go ahead and ask each individual to, to share some personal reflections and then we'll get into some discussion. Um, so, so with that, if, if Dr. Francis, if, if you could kind of start us off and, and share a little bit. Sure, um, I just wanna start off by saying thank you for that wonderful introduction and um, thank you to the Hopkins Department and Dr. Lynn, congratulations. Um, thank you all for creating this space for these important conversations. I am definitely honored to be here with you this afternoon as well as with my esteemed co-panelists as well. Um, you asked us to really reflect on momentum and it is a word that I think a lot about especially in the context of equity and justice um, as it relates to success in medical training or whether in the context of achieving career goals. And so I really feel sustaining momentum can be difficult when we're faced with new and sometimes overwhelming challenges. 2020 brought us really to a place where society at large is now recognizing racism as a public health issue, um, a public health crisis. 2020 has also provided us better language to better understand that not being a racist is different than living as an anti-racist. While the former um, is passive in action that may continue to drive racism while sustaining momentum really requires something more. It requires living as an anti-racist and that is not only personal, um, it is professional and political for me. And I'm using a framework from Dr. Camera Jones here, but living as an anti-racist really requires active work to dismantle systems of power that structure opportunity and as she states, assigns value based on race or the social interpretation of how we look. Um, and that manifests itself through everyday racism and ideas and, and policies and practices. This relates to medicine as a whole, but also it relates to our field, our specialty in otolaryngology because it directly impacts patient care, it impacts our communities. Um, and returning to Dr. Jones, it can sap the strength as she says of our society and of our workforce as a whole through wasted resources. And we have a lot of untapped potential um, out there. We have a lot of untapped potential in our faculty um, we have a lot of untapped potential in our trainees, um, in the medical students who may choose not to participate um, or not to achieve um, or seek out otolaryngology as their career. And so we have a lot of work to do. Um, my hope is that we can stand in front of these systems at play, and that's really my driver. Um, stand in front of inequitable access policies that exist, how we diversify our workforce, anti-racism education throughout the continuum from learners to seasoned faculty, um, and how we can establish collaborative community efforts I think is important as well. And I'll end with one final reference. I'll end my, my thoughts, my reflections with another reference to Dr. Jones. I heard her speak um, at a public health 
conference in Kansas City maybe a few years back and she made a statement that resonated with me uh, then and it still resonates with me today. It's one of the many guiding principles that I use as I consider what work I'm doing to um, be a leader um, in how we develop our workforce, how we reimagine our workforce. And she states that, or she said that we know how to value. What we have to learn is how not to undervalue. That resonated with me. And I firmly believe that when we lead with this, um, solutions, creative ideas, new ways of doing things will sustain that momentum that will drive lasting change. It's possible. It's very, very possible. We really just have to work towards that vision of equity and justice. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Francis. Um, we'll go ahead, Dr. Jones, would you share some reflections? Yes, <clears throat> um, I uh, echo with uh, what Dr. Francis said, um, the, the gratitude for, for being a part of this um, um, panel. Um, and uh, I also wanna congratulate uh, Dr. Lynn for, um, for this accomplishment. Um, what I would say is that um, in, you know, in 2020, um, the events that unfolded with George Floyd and um, um, the uh, inequities that we've seen as, a, as it relates to the COVID-19 um, has made it clear that, um, um, has made it clear what a lot of us have, have known that the, there isn't the separation between um, uh, uh, healthcare and, and social justice, um, that they're, they're in, intertwined and um, they, they uh, depend on each other uh, for, for, for outcomes. Um, um, one, of, one of my favorite quotes um, that I, I, I like to recite um, often because it, it sort of reminds me of why I'm in medicine is um, the quote goes, um, there's worse than being um, um, poor, worse than being uneducated is being unhealthy. Uh, because when you're unhealthy, you can't do anything about your ignorance or, or, or your poverty. And so what this quote says to me, and I hope that it should, that it should say to, to all of us on the call, is that we have been uh, given a, um, the opportunity and, and ability to really make a difference uh, in people's lives and in the world. And it is upon us um, to um, uh, take our uh, position and to really make a change from, from the bottom uh, up. And, 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 and I'll end with just quoting um, um, uh, Amanda Gorman uh, from the inauguration when she said, you know, we have the opportunity, you know, that there is light um, as long as we're brave enough uh, to see the light and be the light. And so I think um, what this lecture and what this lecture series is about is us understanding the position that we're in and our ability to make a difference from, from the bottom up. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Jones. Um, and Dr. Taylor, if you could share some reflections. Uh, sure, and, and, and I do wanna take a moment, like my colleagues, to just uh, extend my appreciation for being able to be a part of this discussion. Uh, this is a, a really important topics that I think we're talking about and um, certainly impacts all of our practices and all of our existence professionally. Um, I do wanna uh, applaud uh, Johns Hopkins University for not only having this, but continuing to engage in these important uh, matters and, and, and really just congratulation to Sandra who has championed these issues for so long. I think it's a, a, it's a very worthy honor that this uh, lectureship is being named after her and, and, and it's really uh, terrific. And, and again, I, I'd like to thank my co-panelists uh, for the work that they do uh, in their institutions and in our specialty that really have impact. When I think about reflections, and I have uh, uh, since have an invitation uh, to be a part of this conversation, uh, I really have relived my journey um, and, uh, and, and tried to contextualize it also um, within what we've dealt with in the last year. Uh, though certainly the issues that have come to the forefront over this last year are not new. They've been uh, brewing and brewing and brewing and certainly we've seen it boil in some ways that uh, it really shows uh, up, up, up front and close um, some of the challenges that we have. 
I looked at the Baltimore Sun today. Uh, and so we don't need to speak to or reflect about diversity and inclusion by going to Tuskegee or to uh, Henrietta Lacks uh, in, in this very city here. Uh, the lead article on uh, the Baltimore Sun today was red flag raised about race disparity in Maryland's early corona vaccine rollout data. And, and, and so that there are uh, many, many other topics that don't reach the level of headlines in, in the newspaper that we are dealing with and confronting every day. And, and I think what gives me um, what gives me encouragement is that this conversation is happening uh, more broadly, uh, more often in a way that uh, I think encourages me that we'll have a chance to make impact. Um, and then I'll share a little bit uh, of something that has impacted me, some of the reading on Scott Page, who is, Scott Page is a professor uh, at University of Michigan Business School. And he looks at corporate success across multiple industries, medicine being obviously a key industry uh, in, in our society. And uh, as objectively as one uh, uh, could show, um, having diversity, diversity in gender, diversity in background, diversity in experience, uh, diversity in ethnicity, um, uh, that organizations that provide diversity, they simply perform better. Um, these are organizations that benefit from the lens and perspectives of people who don't have a homogeneous experience. And for no other reason, um, you, you have enhanced performance. I, I read something in the Harvard Business Review recently that, that proves this point over and over in multiple other industries. And so certainly our ability to advance this in our own uh, in our own field isn't simply because it's, uh, it's morally right, but in the most pragmatic way, we will have a better output and a better outcome among our patients, among providers and so forth. And so um, I'm delighted to be a part of this conversation today. And that's just some of my reflections uh, that I'd like to share. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Taylor. Um, Excellent. So um, with that, we'll go ahead and kind of move in into the discussion. I, I will say, I know we kind of have a, a planned out, but if, if people feel like they would like to, to comment or build on each other's point, please feel free to, to do so. Um, so to, to get us started, um, where I would say we, we need to start and just like many of you referenced is, is to just recognize that, you know, almost eight months have now passed since the killing of George Floyd. And, you know, there was a, a rush to respond, to, to make statements, to, to hold discussions. Um, but as you have all also pointed out that we have been here before. Um, and, and I would like you to, to reflect on, you know, where we're now in terms of, do you think we have made real progress as a discipline? And, you know, if so, um, you know, how so? Um, and if not, you know, how, how do you think that we haven't made progress as a discipline? And, and Dr. Francis, if we can start with you. Sure, sure. Um, you know, I, I do think there has been a consciousness raising and efforts at education in the last eight months. Um, you know, I think most uh, departments, most institutions started off with um, statements and then there became, okay, what do we do with these statements? And so there's been a lot of efforts at um, recognition, acknowledging um, historical injustice, acknowledging what is happening now, um, as Dr. Taylor alluded to, what's happening today um, as we move forward. And I think all of those elements are important. I hinted at this a little bit earlier. I also believe that we need to have bold and proactive um, moves and actions in our efforts. And I think change is, change is often based in past actions. This is what has gone wrong or this is what um, did not go the way we would like. And so then we are changing our behaviors or changing our actions to navigate that. And that shouldn't be ignored. Um, but I think as 
oppression in our society is fully integrated, we really have to be proactive in, in the ways that we move forward. And so the question that I ask myself, the question that I would um, ask our audience is, you know, how are we interrogating our own ideas, our own policies, our own standards? Every time we rely on a norm, um, should we ask ourselves, how is racism operating here? Um, who is not at the table? Who's who is not being heard with what we are currently doing or how we are currently doing it. You know, for example, um, this is residency season in, in residency selection, what do we mean by fit? Do our practices around fit align with our stated values? Those are the questions that I think we constantly have to be asking ourselves so that we are staying ahead of what where we have been as opposed to figuring it out and then working backwards. That's really the way to innovate, in my opinion, and the way that we move forward. Um, how and why do we select Grand Round speakers as an example? Are we actively excluding um, Black faculty as an example from these lists? Um, those are proactive ways in how we move forward. And I think intentionality is a word that is often used, but it's very important here when we're talking about how to be proactive and change systems and structures that have historically been inequitable um, and unjust. Thank you, Dr. Princes. Um, Dr. Jones, your thoughts. Do you, do you think we've made, made real progress as a discipline? Um, I think it's, it's hard to quantify one because um, um, some of the, the, the data, um, um, I don't think we've, we've done the best job of, of, of collecting. Um, but as far as moving forward, I think what is important um, you know, post what happened in, in 2020 is um, to focus on uh, processes that that um, outlast some of the individual um, changes that 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 we tend to make or that we've made um, in the past. And I think um, you know, Carrie was um, alluding uh, to it as well. Um, you know, there's certain things that we do. You know, I've had the the, the fortune of um, sitting on a couple of uh, NIH review committees, uh, study sections. Um, um, I've um, recently, um, as an associate ed editor for Laryngoscope, um, if we look at some of the processes um, and what I would consider, you know, if you, you know, not to talk about politics, but if you look at politics, you know, um, politics start local. And so if you look at, you know, how does somebody get to um, uh, the, the, the point that Dr. Taylor is at to be, you know, chair uh, of an of a institution, you have to start from the ground up. And so when you have processes, you know, for example, um, reviewing uh, manuscripts um, uh, that sometimes can, can put a, a bias in, and not necessarily on a gender uh, standpoint, but it can even be on, on an institutional standpoint. You know, one of the things that I've thought is why don't we blind manuscripts submissions so that the merit of the work can stand on its on its own so that we don't um you know we don't um, um add an unintentional bias for the institution of whoever the author is i mean i've read papers before and i look at the authors and i say the only reason this got published is because of the senior author um, and so those are processes that will outlive things that we do on an individual basis. Um, and so I think in order for us to really get momentum um, moving forward, we need to uh, scrutinize these processes that have become um, law. It's like precedent. They become precedent, they're law, um, uh, to see if we, if they, the unintended consequence is that they pre prevent and marginalize um, uh, uh, different parts of our specialty. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, and, and Dr. Taylor, do you, do you think we have made real progress as a discipline? Um, you know, I, I would answer uh, that with recognizing that, that, you know, this is more complex than, than yes and no. And, and certainly the fact that we're having this discussion now and it is as important and it is endowed uh, a lectureship uh, certainly encourages me. But if we uh, look at the simple facts, and uh, you, know, you know, last month in Laryngoscope, uh, there was an article, uh, a study 
that demonstrated that underrepresented my, uh, minorities in otolaryngology has been flat over the last 10 years. And for African-Americans, it actually is, is going down. Um, uh, there was uh, another article in November um, in another journal uh, in the JAMA Network where uh, it uh, suggested that uh, in otolaryngology, uh, the lowest, has, it, we have the specialty that has the lowest um, percentage of African-Americans than any subspecialty, uh, period. And, and so I think those facts, um, if, we're, if we're looking at the facts, we can say that we've got a lot of work to do. Um, one of the things that was really uh, captivating, I think, when we looked at 2020 is, you know, we have unfortunately lived to see uh, many underrepresented minorities, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, homosexuals and anyone who is not uh, normative, you know, sort of be sacrificed and there does, there's, there's not much to it. Uh, or the local uh, demographics are, are, are what support it. And, and, you know, countless uh, individuals in my home city, Philadelphia and Baltimore, uh, African-Americans um, are, are murdered unjustly. We saw Mr. Floyd and, and we saw that uh, live and in our homes and we saw it over nine minutes. And what really I think was different about that experience is the, is the diversity of the folks who were appalled and who took out on the street, got out of the comfort of their homes in a pandemic to express their outrage of how life can be so devalued that way. Um, and I think that's important if we, if we look at that experience and, and we want to flash back to our subspecialty as a microcosm, uh, it will take people other than the underrepresented minorities to stand up uh, and express uh, their sentiments about how important it is to have broad representation. Uh, and until we have that, a consistent, broad feeling and sentiment uh, that, that is appropriate, I, I think that we will continue to uh, stumble. If we look at the changing demographics of our country, um, underrepresented minorities continue to grow rapidly. And despite increased residency positions over the last 10 years, we've gone from 273 to 315, that percentage of underrepresented minorities has not at all increased while their, uh, while their presence in our society has. And so I think until we get on one accord about what our priorities are and if indeed collectively we think that's important and that the support for that is broad, until that time, you know, we'll have pocketed uh, really um, heroic uh, efforts to uh, kind of raise the banner, but, but we'll be stalled as a subspecialty. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Taylor. Um, does anybody want to comment any any further, but on any uh, on any of that that was raised? Um, Dr. Francis, I'll I'll turn to you. Um, with your various roles over the years in, in medical education, you know, from from medical school admissions to to student affairs. What have you learned kind of from the, the space of undergraduate medical education and, and other disciplines, um, you know, that we can be doing within otolaryngology? Oh. Yeah, unmute. <laughs> Great question. Um, yeah, I spent the last four years in student affairs um, in our student affairs office with you and me. So I've been able to be a part of, as you mentioned, admissions processes for prospective students, but also for our current and matriculated students, um, the ability to facilitate socialization and coaching and support. And so you and me, our undergraduate medical education is still a work in progress. And here's the and. Um, there are a few areas where I do think um, undergraduate medical education has been um, has, has sort of led the way or perhaps been an early adopter of different elements. You know, I think what is important and, and huge is pipeline development and targeted recruitment. And I think the nuance here is that that's based on a commitment to building relationships rather than one-off opportunities. And so that takes time as both of my co-panelists have alluded to, you know, it requires a process and it requires time. It's hard to quantify in such short amounts of time, but really working towards 
towards building those relationships. Intentionality around a selection process, of course, that is a huge topic of conversation in you and me, um, and certainly a topic of conversation in GME as well, um, especially as STEP is going to pass fail. You know, the AAMC reports a wide variability of graduation rates related to MCAT. And I think it really just solidifies the, the point that we also have to continue to think about the metrics that we use. You know, perhaps the shift for our field is less about what your MCAT or what your step score means um, as more or, or more importantly about what educational and or mental health support um, is needed for success in residency. I think paying attention to um, the experience, the experiences of students who are underrepresented is an important aspect, recognizing um, that black faculty or black students, indigenous um, students of color who are underrepresented, you know, have different needs and how can we support some of those needs, recognizing that experiences may be different. And there are so many ways that experiences are the same, but really supporting that all together. Um, this includes looking at the way professionalism um, can be weaponized as an example. What do we mean by professionalism and, and does the definition that we use actively exclude? Um, assessing or interrogating assessment methods. You know, most of the focus goes towards standardized testing and there are questions to be asked there, but another less discussed part of the conversation is around narrative assessments or even write-ups. Um, are our residents who are underrepresented in medicine um, consistently, consciously, or even unconsciously targeted? How does that impact the learning environment and development? I think there's a great conversation or a great question in the chat um, about students uh, who are under, or I'm sorry, residents who are underrepresented um, being asked to leave their programs at higher rates. What information are we gathering? What information are we using? What support systems are in place? And I think the undergraduate medical education has really put a lot of focus into support um, and recognizing that the entryway is an important component of success, but the experience that's had during that time of development is just as, if not more important for our students' um, success. And I think that's definitely something that we need to um, want to think about within otolaryngology um, residency as well. And, and you know, this can transfer and, and be scaled for faculty. Um, faculty feeling undervalued, faculty feeling isolated. There are a lot of ways that some of these similar um, concepts can be scaled up along the continuum of medical education. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Francis. Um, I will next turn to, to Dr. Jones. Um, as, a, and as an NIH-funded researcher, what can and should we be doing to support Black clinician scientists? Um, yes, that's a, that's a, a great question, uh, Carrie. Um, I think that um, there's some common themes that um, um, have been said um, uh, today, and one of them is around value. Um, I think that when you look at researching, you know, doing re translational research um, for a um, for a black uh, researcher, it's um, you know having the opportunity to feel to feel valued. Um, so if we look at you know for for example, my my NIH uh, research is on keloids. Um, um, if you compare and contrast keloids to something like psoriasis, um, so there's about 125 million people in the world with psoriasis. If you look at the symp symptomatology of, of psoriasis and keloids, it's pretty similar. Um, itching, pain, uh, chronic irritation and skin infection. Um, if we look at the numbers of uh, people um, that are affected, we know the majority, 87% are affected, uh, are Caucasian patients. Keloids is the exact opposite. You know, it's about 87% uh, patients of darker skin we don't know how many people in the world have keloids, um, but if we extrapolate from the data that says that about 10 to 20% of, of at-risk populations uh, have it, it will be more than 125 uh, million people. If we look at NIH funding, and I looked at this uh, uh, last night, um, there were nine grants for keloids, five, I mean, not for keloids, for, for um, psoriasis, five R01s, 
Um, and for keloids in 2020, there were two grants. There was my KOA award and one K20, K23, which is going to end in next year. Um, and and if we and so to go back to what we talked about before, you know, some of it is, is process. You know, if you look at the statistics when it comes to um, um, uh, who gets NIH funding, who who doesn't, um, African Americans and women are less likely. Um, if you are a uh, African American uh, with a medical degree, you know your chances increase a little bit. If you're at a medical school, it increases a little bit. Um, but interestingly, one of the things that hurts you is doing patient human subject research. And if anything that we've learned about COVID and 2020 is that patients, in order to do human research, you know, you have to be able to connect with patients. Um, and so we know that there's a lot of mistrust and uh, historically in the and uh, the healthcare system because of a lot of things that have been done. And so in order for us to move the needle uh, for disparities, social determinants, um, the research has showed us that we need to have providers that look like the community uh, that we're trying to, to serve. And so when you have uh, African-American research, the value that African-American research researchers have is that we are interested in conditions that affect um, people that look like us. And we're interested in working in areas uh, where people are like us. And so when we have processes that devalue or make it difficult for us to, to do those type of things, um, you know, like, like uh, Dr. Taylor said, you know, we'll do individual heroic events, um, but we will uh, be uh, challenged and it'll be difficult for us to move, move the needle. So when we look at African-American researchers, the thing that we really have to do is uh, be aware who's out there, be aware what their interests and look for ways to partner. I think one of the biggest misconceptions or one of the ways that we, that we, that we um, uh, um, um, fail is that to have this idea that, that we can't grow the pie. And I think that if we are more inclusive, we collaborate more, we will create more opportunity and we'll have more innovation um, and, and better outcomes. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Jones. Um, Dr. Taylor, I'll, I'll turn to you. Um, so as you have stated and, and many, um, we, we all recognize the, the lack of diversity across otolaryngology. And I'd really say, you know, I think specifically at the, at the leadership level, and, and I don't think those really numbers have changed. Um, so, so as a department chair, why have we failed to make progress in increasing diversity specifically at that, that leadership level from, from your perspective? Um, and you know, where, how should we focus our efforts as departments or organizations in, in trying to address that? Sure, and uh, thank you. I, my co-panelists have already spoken to it at, at earlier stages. When you look at the undergraduate level, the medical school level, residency level, you know, uh, all of those things are critical in terms of the, the pathway to provide for, uh, for leadership. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, uh, as we mentioned, I, I think that there's a couple of things that are promising and a couple of suggestions. And so one of the things is while 2.4% uh, of residents are of African-American descent, uh, it turns out that a similar percentage is also uh, uh, in academic medicine. And so I think that's just one little uh, sort of nugget to suggest that if you have some mentorship and you see it, that there's an inclination to uh, be able to uh, follow a path. And, and I think that um, uh, one of the important things is uh, engaging early on. And so uh, even in medical school, I, I think that if our otolaryngology departments across the country are engaged at the earliest time, you know, month one, the underrepresented minority organizations that exist on campus um, to teach them about otolaryngology. So often they don't learn about us until they're uh, deep into their clinical experience or they've gone far along and, and they don't even understand our path. And it's a competitive path. And so a lot of it is both exposure and engagement. Um, I think the other thing to note is that if you look at academic medicine, um, there's a, a higher rate of attrition of African-Americans and underrepresented minorities in academics uh, compared to uh, our majority peers. However, 
However, and that is true at the assistant professor level. However, if you get to the associate professor level, the retention rate is identical to that among our peers. And so there's something to look forward there that if, if we can be very, uh, as Dr. Francis meant, intentional and understand uh, how to do that professional development to help someone get from an assistant professor to an associate professor, then you do have durability. And then you do increase the ability in the pool uh, for, for leadership. And so I think that that's encouraging. And when I think about my faculty and faculty development, um, I, I absolutely try to tailor it and understand what their individual and specific needs are, because they are. And, and even though many of our, uh, our underrepresented colleagues are very well trained, uh, both Dr. Francis, Dr. Jones come from excellent educational pedigrees, sometimes if you don't have a, a mentor, and that mentor does not have to look like you, it certainly helps because the data shows that uh, both residents and medical students are attracted to programs and institutions where there is representation of people who look like them. Um, but, but you can have an excellent educational uh, uh, journey, but that does not assume that because of maybe some other uh, disparities um, in, in your upbringing and your experience, you may not know exactly how to, 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 to craft your academic path. And so having some more, um, I think, hands-on experience um, and tailoring it to underrepresented minorities, recognizing that if you can get them to that promotional period to associate professor, the retention is very high. I think that will uh, increase uh, the, uh, you know, the, the absolute number and opportunity uh, and the pool for opportunity for leadership. And then I'll, I'll kind of end with, I think, something that is really near and dear to me. And, and certainly Lamont can experience this, Dr. Uh, Dr. Brown, who has chimed in and who has been a, a former uh, speaker uh, for this lecture series. Um, we uh, were at Michigan at a time when there was a real uh, critical mass. And that didn't happen by accident. The late, great Charles Krause, uh, who his name is born on our, on our text with, of course, Dr. Cummings. Um, he had an experience that transformed him. He was a farm boy from Iowa. And his daughter started dating an African-American. And it was that exposure and that experience that turned his light on to understand what his role would be in training the next generation of otolaryngologists that would represent the world we live in. And Greg Wolf, who became chairman after him, uh, certainly kept up that tradition. And, and so you have someone like a Charles Krause or a Greg Wolf who can serve as a sponsor and a mentor. And I can tell you that I, pa I patterned my clinical practice and Greg Wolf was a role model to me and I had an opportunity to work with Dr. Krause. But there was a critical mass of us like David Brown, like uh, um, Lamont Jones, uh, like um, uh, Charles Boyd, Monty Harris, um, Larry Myers, um, and I can go on and on, Charles Moore at Emory. And, and you look at those folks, and 20 years later, you have the vast majority of them still in academic medicine, uh, ascending in the leadership roles. Among them, I forgot, uh, Oneida Rosarina, among them are deans and leaders in, in our field. And so I say that to say that you know, it, again, it's not going to take underrepresented minorities lifting themselves up. We have to agree, and there have to be leaders in power right now who agree that that is important and who have a role of being sponsors and mentors and advocating and facilitating um, the opportunity that we share. And, and, and those role models have been enduring. As I mentioned, uh, many of us decades into our career uh, continue to be passionate about uh, academic medicine and having an impact at our institutions nationally and around the world. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Taylor, for that. Um, looking at the time, I'm going to go ahead and, and skip to my la last question, um, and then we'll we'll have some time for some of the audience questions. Um, so, so with that, we're in January 2021 um, and the start of a, a new year. Uh, what one action are you taking in your life to advance the the broader mission towards towards equity? 
So um, I'll go ahead, and, Dr. Taylor, if you want to start. Sure, sure. Um, so one of the things that is important to me is I, I, I have an opportunity to engage uh, faculty uh, and residents uh, around our institution, around topics of unconscious bias and how the history, uh, understanding how bias uh, is created, uh, its importance as, uh, an, uh, as, a, as a feature in how we navigate our lives, but how it also can have a deleterious impact on how we conduct ourselves and what we hold is important in our, uh, in our academic missions, how we can sometimes uh, um, uh, go against that. And so uh, that is important work to me. And so I enjoy having an opportunity to engage uh, our faculty our new faculty and mentorship uh, around that area. Uh, and then beyond that, uh, I, I do enjoy uh, really on a national level, I, I have underrepresented minorities who I engage regularly and repeatedly uh, as a mentor, even at different institutions, students, medical students, residents who have I've had touch points with who we continue. And I feel so blessed and fortunate uh, of the people who were generous enough to spend time uh, investing in my future, uh, that it is with, with great uh, joy and fulfillment that, that I try to give that back. And so there, there are two ways that on a daily basis, uh, I try to continue to uh, improve that. Great, excellent. Um, Dr. Francis, if you could talk about an action you're taking in your life. Sure. So, you know, I'm very focused um, on empowerment. So that's, that's the lens that I use and um, my purpose, I think, in um, academia. And, you know, I really strive to help our workforce build an integrated life um, through power, purpose, and the communities that we build um, within our academic environments. And so for me, um, one of the ways that that looks like in 2021 is sharing opportunities when and how I can. So, you know, being able to leverage my position to provide um, or facilitate opportunities for others and helping support their growth um, is one of the steps that I'm taking. And not just in theory, but, you know, do I need to participate in every project? Do I need to give every lecture? How can I move away from a scarcity mindset that, in my mind, um, models the behavior of, of hoarding and what we really, what I really want to do is sort of expand our understanding of what it looks like, whatever that it is for whomever. Um, and I'd like to really model that behavior and really value creating the space for others to grow through diversity of thought, which I ultimately believe um, leads to subsequent innovation. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Francis. And then last but not least, Dr. Jones, if you could talk us to talk to us about one action you're taking in your life to to move toward equity. So when, when I um, joined Henry Ford, um, I came back home to, de to Detroit. One of the first things I did that the high school that I graduated from uh, was about a, a mile and a half from <clears throat> from our main hospital. Um, and one of the first things I did was reconnect with the high school. I set up so that during my lunch break, I could go to the school and, and teach a class. Um, and and at, at the school, I taught a class. I used physics and my um, trauma training to um, um, teach the kids why it was important to, to wear their seatbelt and not drink and drive. Um, and so for me, um, what I've decided to do more uh, this year, you know, not to 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 requote um, um, uh, Amanda uh, Gorman, but I think she said it so ec uh, eloquently that you know I want to be I want to be the light, and so one of the things that I've decided to do this year is to be to be present, um, and so you know we can I can go back to um, uh, places where underrepresented minorities are and and volunteer, and this is something I've been doing my, my whole life. But I think that the other opportunity is to be present in other circles so that we can help dispel the, um, uh, some of the myths and the stereotypes of uh, who are the people that are in the room that are qualified to be in the room. And so for me, you know, traveling around the world, lecturing uh, on um, um, my research, 
uh, performing of, of uh, uh, medical mission surgeries is my way of being the light. And I think that those are the, the things that will help me uh, expand my influence and, and, and to make a, a, a difference to help move the needle. That's great, thank you. Um, looking through the, the questions, we've got a lot of great questions. So thank you for, for everybody um, who contributed. Um, I, I think one, I would just call up just to see if there's any initial responses in terms of, I, I, I think you would have some great words of encouragement. Um, what advice do you have for residents or young faculty who feel undervalued in their present situations? Um, anybody who, who would like to, to answer that? I, I can I can tell a, a short story. Um, so I think that you should never underestimate what you're capable of doing and, and influencing. Um, one of the one of the, the stories that I tell when I, when I was a, a resident at University of Michigan, you know, like rightly said, we we got great training. Um, we were exposed to to world class um, uh, research, but the one thing that was lacking was we did not have exposure to underserved uh, populations. Um, and so one of the things that I did as a resident, um, we used to volunteer at a, as a medical students at University of Michigan, we volunteered at a free clinic uh, that was um, in Ypsilanti. Um, and I realized volunteering there that there were no access to subspecialty uh, consults. So if you had a patient that came in that had an ENT problem, you had to write a consult um, and hope that one of the local uh, ENT groups would see the patient. And usually they had a limit. They would do maybe five or six free uh, per year. So I approached the administration at, at University of Michigan um, to see if as residents, we could staff a once a month clinic where they can send all of the, the, the ENT consults. Um, it was, you know, it was, it was, it was um, accepted. Um, you know, we were given permission to, to do it. But for the first two years, I essentially... Uh, once a month, staffed the clinic um, at night uh, for like the first two years. Fast forward after I graduated, um, uh, University of Michigan brought the program onto campus. Um, they uh, have a faculty member that's over and staffing uh, the clinic, and they subsequently won a community service award from the health system. Um, and so I think that like anything else, never underestimate your ability uh, to, to, to make a difference and make a change, especially if it's, if it's something that's, um, that's, that's right and uh, involves uh, 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 patient care. Okay. Would anybody want to, to add anything to, to Dr. Jones's? I'll, I'll be oh. brief uh, on the question. I'm sorry, Carrie. You're fine. Um, uh, uh, I'll be brief and, and it's, a, it's a little bit maybe more of a complex question to give a full answer to in the context without knowing details. But what I would encourage anybody who feels that way is to remember that a part of how you feel valued must require that you're not looking for someone else's approval uh, or validation. You know, you, what, what your priorities are and what's important to you and, and your strengths and your gifts and your talents, they don't need to be validated by anyone. Um, and so that's first. And, and, and then the second part of the question really needs to understand some of the specifics on how you begin to educate someone else to value the things that are important to you would be, would be my response to that. And Dr. Francis, did you wanna say anything or? You know, I, I'll add on just a little bit. You know, I think in medicine we have, uh, currently we have such a narrow, understanding of what it means to be um, a physician of what it means to do this work. And um, I think what Dr. Taylor said is so important in being able to identify your own purpose and sort of how you align your purpose with your activities. Because when, when challenges arise, when you're feeling undervalued, you know, one of our strengths, this is, you know, where resiliency, I think is truly, um, the appropriate word is to be able to sort of get back to that that ultimate purpose and that ultimate goal. And it, it is often a difficult um, task to do that or to wade through that. But having that North Star, I think, really helps impact our ability to stay um, to stay along the path and to stay focused. Great. Um, I am 
so sad to 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 end our our discussion um, because we are the hour is is quickly upon us. But um, I just any kind of last before I make some summarizing remarks. Any last things, brief things that anybody would like to to comment on or share. I, I, the one thing I would uh, say is that, um, and I was speaking to uh, uh, some scrub tech students today uh, in West Baltimore, and someone asked me, did, did you ever feel like you wanted to give up? And, and, and so I think that, you know, whether you're in high school or whether you're in academics, no matter where you are on your journey, my response was, while I never felt like I wanted to give up, there have been countless moments of doubt. And, uh, and Dr. Francis met, mentioned something about your North Star. And what I encourage uh, the, the students I was speaking to earlier today is that doubt is okay. It's gonna happen, um, it's expected, uh, but you can't wallow in it. You have to go back to your North Star and making sure you identify those elements that are your priority and how you define yourself and your talents are critical. And so if there are residents or medical students who happen to be listening in and they wonder if a doubt has been a part of my experience or Dr. Francis' experience or Dr. Jones, I assure you, I will answer for them. Absolutely, uh, it's been a part of our experience. And, and But you do have to uh, recenter and believe in yourself to know that while that is normal, that you can't wallow in it. Yeah, excellent. All right, can I just say thank you. I wanna really personally say thank you to the panelists. You've, really a lot of um, good discussion and thoughts. And um, I wanna really um, also thank, we had a tremendous amount of attendees and a lot of chat. And so I think that speaks to you all panelists um, and Carrie's moderating um, that to really raise our thought and interest. And um, thank you so much. Great. Pleasure. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Lynn. Thank you to Dr. Jones, Dr. Francis, Dr. Taylor for, for joining us um, for, for your thoughts, um, comments. Um, we so greatly appreciate it. Um, we have a, a you know, small token of our appreciation and honorarium and, and, a, and gifts will be in route um, to you. So to come, um, but thank you so much for taking the time. And I think just like the theme is, you know, diversity inclusion is hand and equity for sure is all hand in hand with excellence. And we have to be thinking about, you know, yes, as organizations, but it's just like, you know, Dr. Jones said, we have to think about how we are that light and how we are that excellence in the full meaning of the word every single day. Um, so hopefully this is your reminder for today, but you'll have a reminder reminder for tomorrow to keep us all moving in that direction. So thank you all for, for joining us um, for our fifth annual and our first endowed Sandra Y. Lynn um, endowed lecture on diversity, inclusion, equity. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. All right. Congratulations again, Sandra. Yes. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you.